Hello. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club Friday Forum. I'm Corleen Kraft, president of the club. And it is Friday the 13th. And I'm wondering how many of you suffer from scaricavita cotriophobia. That is the fear of Friday the 13th, which I looked up. And I can tell you that I, as your president, suffer from periscavita phobia because those of you who are regulars know how many times I've stood up here on Fridays and said, we have a mystery program. Something unexpected has occurred. So today, our speaker was to be Speaker of the House, Karen Minnis, but we learned last night that the governor had called a special meeting of the leaders today to discuss the budget, and so there was a lot of scrambling going on to see who we could bring in her stead. Well, happily this morning, Representative Dennis Richardson from uh, who is Speaker Pro Tem graciously agreed to step in at the last minute. So we're very grateful for that. And he'll bring both her perspective and his perspective to the program today. Oh, prior to the, the program beginning, would you please be good enough to turn off your cell phones or anything else that rings or flashes? And uh, I will have a few brief announcements before we begin the program. Next Friday Forum on May 20th will be held here, and it's, the program is about higher education in Oregon, finishing old homework and making new assignments. And our speakers will be George Pierstiner, who's the acting chancellor of the Oregon's university system, Tim Nesbitt, who's on the Oregon State Board of Higher Education, Gretchen Schutte, who's Oregon State Board of Higher on the board and president of Chemeketa Community College, and Dr. Edward John Ray, who's president of Oregon State University. It'll be really interesting, especially following today's program. Now, I would like to mention that word fundraising again. I am sorry that we have to keep asking for you to reach into your pockets, but I think the work that we do is certainly rewards any time you write a check to us. We have a spring challenge that uh, will be matched by Don and Mary Frisbee, Peter and Harriet Watson, Kaiser Permanente, and an anonymous donor who's given a gift in honor of the late Tom Deering, who was a great friend of the club and of the community. Now their challenge is that if you make a contribution by June 15th, they will match it, or we can match it, up to $10,000, and that will help us get over the hump this year for all of the new things that we have done, our move to the new office space and many of the new programs we've implemented. So I have visual aids. You have envelopes on your table. If uh, you would feel so inclined, we would be most grateful for your support because every dollar you donate will be matched by these other donors. Now our other fundraising event that it follows up on our last year's uh, Citizen Salons. As those of you who attended know, they're small dinner parties with, hosted by very interesting people and with a guest provocateur uh, of whom you can ask any question that might have been tearing away at you. This week, we're starting that, and it's in fact tomorrow night, and it will be hosted by Mike Burton and his wife, Terry, and their guest provocateur is Bob Caldwell, who's the editor of Oregonian's editorial page. So if you want to know something about editorial policy, if you have a comment about editorial policy, uh, this is your opportunity. There are still a few seats left, and you can uh, call the office and, and sign up. And I'm sure that Mike and Terry will be interesting hosts as well. Now, another visual aid, this says you're invited. This gives you the information about all the rest of the salons that will be held this summer. And uh, there's something for everyone, and they went, the seats went very quickly last year, so I'm hopeful you'll have an opportunity to sign up soon and enjoy what the club has to offer. Finally, our post he lecture discussion is winding up Thursday, next Thursday, May 19th at the City Club Commons. And it follows up the lecture by Gary Snyder entitled Portland in Context, Reflecting on Mount St. Helens. Those have been uh, very interesting discussions as well. Now, details on all of these events and on how to become a member, which we certainly invite all of our guests to do, uh, can be found at the website, www.pdxcityclub.org. So please uh, go in to that site, sign up as a member, and sign up for one of the citizen salons. You won't be sorry. Now, I'd like to thank our sponsors this quarter, who are Pope and Talbot, Incorporated, 
Providence Health Systems, and Zimmer Gunsel Frasca. They help underwrite these programs, uh, the broadcast of these programs. We're very grateful for their support. Now I'd like to introduce Congressman Dennis Richardson. He lives in Central Point and was elected as representative from District 4 in 2002, and this is his first term as Speaker Pro Tem. Dennis served as chairman of the Oregon Republican Party's second congressional district from 96 to the year 2000, and as treasurer of the Oregon State Republican Party from 1999 until 2003. He's a decorated Vietnam helicopter pilot, and he earned his law degree from Brigham Young University. Since graduating from law school, he's been practicing law in Central Point, where his practice now focuses, when he's not all tied up at the legislature, on protecting the rights of Oregon consumers as an insurance plaintiff's attorney. So please welcome Dennis Richardson. Thank you, Corleen. And thank you, members of the City Club, for allowing me to join you at this at the kind of last minute. Uh, before I start, I first want to offer apologies from Speaker Minnis for not being able to join you today. She uh, is called to meetings at the Capitol, and hopefully uh, the governor will be able to help break a gridlock that uh, has brought about an impasse that could make this a very long legislative session. Anyway, we need to work on the state's budget, and she's unable to be here because that's such a priority for all of us. She hopes to join you at a future date, and in the meantime, offers me as a stand-in. So if you, see any, if you hear things that are very controversial, those are my opinions, and if they're very astute, those are her opinions. And so I just want to make sure that that was clear to begin with. You know, last session was my first session in the legislature. Before that, I'd been on the city council for Central Point, and I had so many times said, what are they doing up there? That finally I decided, you know, I'm gonna go up there and find out. And so I, I ran in a primary election against the assistant majority leader, which I found out later was not nice. You know, you're not supposed to run against a sitting Republican, but I thought that's what primaries were for. And I ended up getting 61% of the votes. And uh, so I got sent up here and I promised not to get amnesia when I drove north of Roseburg. And so I'm uh, presently as was, mentioned by Corlina, uh, I'm Speaker Pro Tem, I'm also the chair of the Human Services Subcommittee for Ways and Means. And that was uh, an interesting decision to put me with my politics in that position where we're dealing with $9.7 billion of money that's for the most needy citizens in Oregon with hundreds of programs, each one of which has its own constituency, each one of which needs more money and each one of which comes in and says, essentially, gore somebody else's ox, but leaves ours alone. Well, anyway, we have to deal with this because these are tough times. I mean, we are facing a collapsing economy that has affected us, as, as you remember. You know, the demand for spending has far exceeded the money that we've had. In the 2003 session, you know, when it ended late that summer after raising the personal income tax and a host of other taxes to balance the budget, you know, I opposed those taxes, uh, the tax increases. I thought it was irresponsible to raise taxes on Oregonians by record amounts when so many of our workers are out of a job. I also thought the legislature had gotten too greedy and had asked for too much. And I remember saying, it was my first session, I'm saying, you know, we can't tax our way out of a recession. Uh, and so I was talking to a, a group that uh, were involved with you know, the agriculture, and I said, you know what this is like? This is like we have a cow, and Oregon is the cow, and it's weak, it's anemic. And so half of this building says, you've gotta milk harder, just milk harder because we need more milk. And maybe it would make more sense for us to feed the cow, nourish it, give it a little bit of a break so that we can strengthen it so that we can have a long-term benefit. Well, anyway, we saw Measure 30 as an outcome of the idea that what we really need to do is milk the anemic cow uh, you know, more aggressively, and we've seen what the majority of the citizens of Oregon thought of that decision. And you know what happened next? I mean, the, the taxpayers, we voted on Measure 30. I spoke against the tax increase at a time when that wasn't very popular among the legislators. I said that there's money that is going to come forward, the sky is not going to fall, to fall and then 
Actually, as we all know, after Measure 30 was voted down, Department of Human Services came up with one, one point, let's see, $117.2 million in revenue that they were able to kind of free up to make sure that the programs that they said were not going to be refunded were in fact funded. And so all that did was to tell the people that their suspicions about the way the legislature functions were really well founded. That there is more money, that you always ask for more, and that there's never enough. And the problem with that is we need to be building trust with the people through a transparency and honesty and not merely continuing to play these games. The people understand that and so the people said enough is enough. Notwithstanding the fact that you've threatened us that um, the, the elderly will be thrown out of their rest homes and that schools will shut down and that um, our life as we know it will terminate in Oregon, the people said irrespective of all of that, live within your means. There was a record number of, of uh, uh, signatures gathered on the petitions, as you know, and we had Measure 30 on the ballot very quickly, and it was, and the tax increases were voted down by an overwhelming margin. Now, voters sent the lawmakers a message with that vote. They said, we're done. We are sending you all that we want to send. Do the job with what you have. Live within your means. And that's exactly what the speaker and many of my colleagues in the House intend to do this session. There will always be demands to spend more than we have. In a, a world, it's, it's as if the world should have unlimited revenue, and if that were the case, you know, we could be spending more and then expanding everywhere in all the various programs. But the reality is that we're just coming out of a recession. And at the heart, the government needs to know that we must meet our obligations to the citizens with the money that we have available. I told my committee that it's like I'm a purchasing agent, that we are purchasing agents, and the people have given us a finite amount of money. And they've said, go out and buy the most essential, the most effective, the most efficient programs with the money that we've given you. And when the money's gone, stop buying. And that is the hard part for the legislative process. As you recall, you know, two years ago, it was, we need to have more of this, okay, we can do that, we need more of this, we can do that. And at the end of it, we're $800 million short. Well, I don't know about your budget and in your families, but we think in our family, you know, you pay the mortgage first, you pay, you know, health insurance, car insurance, you, you buy your food before you pay everything else. You have priorities. But the way it's worked in the legislature is you decide what you want to spend then you find out how much money you've got, and then you say, well, where can we get the rest? And so in the past, and it, by the way, this is nonpartisan. This is, you look at the last 10 years, in the 90s, the Republicans controlled the legislature, and we had a Democrat governor, but the spending went up by 7.8% per year, compounded for a decade. And then when the recession comes, are we surprised that there's not enough money to pay for it? We had built government to a point that was unsustainable because there was going to be an adjustment, but there had been no planning for that adjustment. Well, even when times are good, it's hard to balance the budget. Now, this is the legislature's only constitutionally mandated responsibility. And we have all these policy bills, and at the end of the session, many of them uh, get killed in committee, many get left in the process, some get signed into law, but they can come over in two years, and so there will be another swing at, at, at that pitch two years from now. But when it comes to the financial matters, we cannot adjourn without a balanced budget. And so that is the challenge that we face. Now, earlier this week, the press reported that Oregon's job growth in March was third highest in the nation. The state's economists predicted that tax revenues will grow by more than 8% in the next two years and by more than 12% in the 0709 biennium. Now that's welcome and overdue news. But what made balancing the budget in 2002 and 2003 so difficult was that the bottom kept dropping out of each quarter. And so you get a financial revenue statement, you know, a, a forecast, and it'd say, okay, here's where it's going to be. And then the next quarter, well, bring the legislature back together because it's less than what we expected. And it goes down and it went down until, you know, finally, it, 
it bottomed out last year, and it's only been in recent months that the state has been gaining the revenue, the thing that this recovery that we've been waiting for. Now, improving our economy doesn't mean that we're poised to go on a spending spree. I mean, that may be what some of the legislators are going to be um, asking for. Uh, some of you may not have heard, but that the forecast that came out for the next biennium is up by $244 million. And that's, that's good news and that's troubling news. The good news is that we are able to have enough money to meet the $12.393 billion biennial budget that's been agreed to by both the Senate and by the House. The difficulty with it is that we have more money than it's going to take to finance that. And if history is any indication, then this legislature is going to be just wringing its hands saying, how do we break this agreement that put a cap? We thought that cap was going to be high enough. But now we've got extra money. We've got to spend it. That is the kind of philosophy that's got us in the trouble that we were in the last two years. When you have a little extra money, it's an average. And so why not set aside some money? The governor, the speaker, they've talked about having a rainy day fund. You know, this would be an ideal time to put a rainy day fund into place. Whether or not there is the discipline in that capital to be wise and plan on a long-term basis remains to be seen, but I'm not confident. Now, one of the reasons that we had to cut back so much last session was because we were not able to exercise the discipline that we need. And we need to learn from history and not merely slip back in the old ways of doing things. You know, in the late 90s, we saw personal income collections a tax grow by as much as 22% in one biennium. That level of growth wasn't going to continue forever. We didn't have the, the wisdom to set aside any money. And so when the crash came, it was like a shock to everyone. We're old enough down there. Now, I wasn't down there, so I'm not going to take credit or responsibility for what they did. But the people down there are not kids. I mean, they've seen cycles. But it seems like when the money was coming in, it was like, oh, what are we going to do? In fact, even in the 2001 session, when they started that session, do you know what the primary question was as they began that session? There's going to be a billion dollars more than we need. How are we going to spend it? Where was the wisdom? to set aside money in the good times for the inevitable adjustments during the recessionary times. It hasn't been there. We need to feel the influence and the voice of the people to bring the legislature into reality that we must set aside money during the good times so that we don't have to drastically cut the schools and drastically cut the programs to our most needy when there's the inevitable recession. Now, the recession hit our state services very, you know, very severely. But it especially hit education hard. The economy wasn't the only culprit to blame, though, for the difficulties that we had with education. Politics played a hand in how the schools and the funding were hurt. For instance, in September 2002, the legislature was meeting in its fifth special session. And during that time, the speaker was involved with negotiations with the other leadership, and as part of the negotiations with then-Governor Kitzhopper and the other leaders of the House and Senate, she knew we were going to have to ask the voters for more money to get through that period. I mean, we're talking about the fifth successive reduction in revenue estimates. The couches in the legislature had been shaken. The, 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 the cushions had no more quarters. They had looked for every every pool of money that they could find, and they still were unable to fund government at, at a sustainable level, and so there was going to be Measure 28. But the question was, what does it include? She felt it shouldn't include education, that it should, that we need to be very careful with that in case Measure 28 failed. She feared that the voters just might say no to the implement, to, to being required to pay more taxes and that if we were to force education, which is on a two-year budget, to have to take its shares of cuts in the last five minutes of the biennium, that would have you know, a horrific effect on the ability to continue the school years and to help teachers keep their jobs. Well, her Democrat colleagues and our governor at the time insisted 
that education be put on the Measure 28 issue as an incentive for voters to approve it. I mean, their message was, vote to raise the taxes or we're gonna cut your schools and affect your children's education. Now that's cruel, it's cynical, and the voters said no. As a result, the school districts across the state were forced to do just that. They had to make substantial cuts. They had to make layoffs. Teachers, uh, you know, many of them were affected. There was this movement around because of seniority where you, know, you don't just lay off someone, it's shift based on their seniority and, and it affects so many people all throughout the system. And, and our school year closed early. But it didn't have to happen this way and Speaker Minnis wanted me to let you know that it didn't have to and that she didn't want it to happen that way, but she thought you ought to know what really led to that. Now schools didn't have to take the brunt of that, as I said. You know, Measure 30 uh, was affected in the same way. In 2003, the House Republicans proposed a smaller tax passage, a package, and I want you to know that I was in the caucus when this is going on, and I, I come from a conservative district, and I was one of those that were saying, you know, we need to live within our means, and, and yet there was enough money, and so the speaker was saying, to, to be reasonable, we need to you know, give a little here, and so finally, I and my colleagues were prepared to do that, but it wasn't enough, and that was a problem. It would have given uh, education more than it ended up with after Measure 30 failed, but the truth was, it wasn't enough, and so it, we couldn't get out of that session until the, you know, the legislators had been lobbied and the special interest groups had had uh, their um, attention you know, being, uh, and efforts uh, rewarded, and we had to raise an income tax by $800 million. And that was during a recession. And so the voters had a chance to speak again. And, and looking back on it, I mean, was it a surprise? We've just voted on Measure 28. We've just said no. We're still in a recession. And now you want another $800 million? You know, I don't, I don't know if it's mentioned, but I've got a son and eight daughters. And so I had like five teenage daughters at one time. And so I'm prepared for politics. I, mean, I understand politics. I was once asked uh, what I knew about women's rights. And I said, with a wife and eight daughters in my family, I understand women's issues. But I also understand that there are times when you have to say, what part of no don't you understand? I mean, there are times when somebody really wants something, and it's, it's you know, we've had teenagers, right? But dad, you don't understand. I really want to go to the party. No, I understand about this party. I've heard about this. I've checked it. You're not, you can't go. But dad, I really want to go. No, I understand you really want to go. No, dad, you must not understand. I really, really, really want to go. I mean, that's the attitude in the, in the capital. It's like, there's not enough money. No, but we really need this program. No, I, no, it, it, I understand that. But we have to live within our means. There's not enough money. You know, we really need, we have elected you to show the courage to get more money to pay for these programs. Say, no, no, wait a second. That's, and there are those that still believe that, except that the majority of the voters don't believe that because they thought they elected re uh, representatives to go and represent their districts and the long-term best interests of the state. And certainly there's, that's open for debate, but ultimately, it has to be passed by 51% of the vote. Anyway, the voters are ticked. And if, if in Portland, that message hasn't been conveyed, I'm here from Central Point to tell you the voters are ticked. The voters feel like they can't trust their government, like no matter what we, they send, taxpayers send, it'll never be enough, and that they don't believe the money's being spent in an efficient and effective manner. And, th and that's the way it is. That's the reality of 51% or more of the voters. And it doesn't matter if 45% think contrary. It's a democracy. And so what we're really dealing with is the need to establish trust, reconnect the people with their government. And that's gonna take transparency. It's gonna take a little bit of time. 
It means opening up the books and showing where the money really is and where it's coming from and where it's going. It means the ability to accept the word of the voters and not try and raise more revenue when they've clearly said, live within your means until you can show us that the money we're already sending is effectively and efficiently being spent. But until then, don't ask for more. I mean, don't you think it's interesting that one out of three Americans sent money to unnamed folks who are victims of the tsunami, and yet they won't give $50 a year additional money to their own state government? I mean, isn't that interesting? Well, the difference is the tsunami people needed it, and the people made the choice to give it. But what we keep doing by trying to raise taxes is say, you must understand we know better than you do as to what you should do with your money. And therefore, just send it to us and let us spend it right and we'll take care of you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, 51% or more of this state do not believe that the government is to be trusted with any more of their money than is absolutely necessary. And so I'm here as a messenger just to remind us all that if we want more tax revenue, if we want to restructure the tax um, stool a three -leg and have a three-legged stool in Oregon, if we want to change the way that revenue is used, we must first gain the respect, the trust, and you know, the support of the people. Now, we can't lead by dragging the people along. It's not, that's not the way it's going to work. We've tried that. We've tried we, meaning collectively, the legislature has tried threatening by, if you don't pass Measure 30, look at the horrific problems. I remember a week before the election, last February, a year ago, on Measure 30, uh, seeing a commercial with ex-Governor Kitzhaber saying, if you don't pass these additional revenues, 85,000 Oregonians will lose their health insurance. Well, at that point, we already were down under 45,000. It wasn't honest. It was a threat. Not that there wasn't the need for the standard population to have more money, but the threat was not honest. And yet, even making it more severe than it really was at that time, the people still said no. We can't drag the people along. We have to lead the people. We have to represent the people. We have to work with them. And, you know, we want to, if we want to have the people join us, we need to inspire them. And this inspiration will come by giving them a reason to follow. We have to regain their trust, as I mentioned. We have to gain their respect, and we have to show that the money that's presently being spent is being spent wisely. Now, I think leadership means making the hard choices, the choices that are necessary to do the best we can with what we have. Until we can do that, until we prove to the people that we can balance the budget without higher taxes, we will never regain their trust. Now this session, we have about $1.4 billion more available than we had in the last session. That's not pocket change. $1.4 billion is real money. This is money that will allow us to back, buy back some of the cuts that we made in 2002 and 2003 and some fund some of the essential services to a higher level, such as education, public safety, programs for the seniors and for the disabled. But we can't recover all of that lost ground in one biennium. It's going to take some time, and it's going to take a strong economy over that time. Balancing the budget isn't simply an exercise in making sure the two columns, the two spreadsheets measure up. We have to balance the state's budget with with responsibility. We need to keep our kids in proper schools, but we've got to keep our neighborhood safe. We've got to provide care and assistance to those who are truly cannot care for themselves. We've got to make sure that we understand the problem that we're having with, um, you know, with the penal system and with the problems of crime and meth. I mean, catch and release should be a practice that fishermen use, not police officers. And yet, without enough money, we're finding ourselves with overly crowded jails, and we're finding, you know, we, we arrest, we bring them in, and at the time we bring them in the front door, we're having to let go 
criminals out the back door before uh, their times are even filled. This is not a good process for us to follow. Now, I suppose we could give um, thought to other ways of doing business. One thing we need to do is to understand that we must plan for the future and not merely make uh, changes based on immediacy. Now, if we're going to educate our kids and make that the highest priority, and I want you to know it is the highest priority, since half of, essentially half of our revenues go to education, I mean, that's got to be a high priority if you're spending half of it, then, you know, we, we could give them the entire general fund, but that would not be fair to the other essential services that we've got. I mean, across the state, we're having a hard time dealing with this, the meth epi epi epidemic, as I mentioned. Um, we could give the schools the whole fund, but if that were to take place, what would we do about the other services? Now, we must make sure that our families are, and our neighborhoods are safe, that those that are in greatest need have the funding that they need, but we can't keep doing it. We can't keep funding the schools the way that we've been doing it in the past. It's crazy the way we go about it. It's like a bidding war. I mean, before the session, the governor announces his recommended budget. Okay, and so that's like December. And then the two houses and the two parties come together and they start working overtime, trying to come up with ways that uh, they can come up with more money. It's like there's, there's an auctioneer going on. It's an out, a war to outbid each other. Well, 5.0, well, no, it really needs to be 5.6 or 5.4. Well, maybe we can do it this way. Well, maybe it could be more. In the process of funding schools, everyone wants to be seen as a friend of education. I mean, the OEA, the advocacy groups, the press define that friendship is by how much money the legislature provides to the schools. But we don't know exactly what we're buying with that money. In Post Measure 5 Oregon, we just write the check. I mean, that's what happens. We write the check, we bundle the money up, and we send it to the school districts, and the local school boards decide how to spend it. Now, there's no science to funding schools in Oregon. It's pure, old-fashioned politics. And it's no way to fund our schools. Speaker Minnis has proposed a solution to this problem. It's called the Stable Schools Plan. You may have read about it in your local paper. The stable schools plan would take the politics out of the school funding calculation by ensuring that schools will have the money that they can rely on, that it'll be reasonable, predictable, and that each year they will be able to better prepare for the challenges of the future by being able to know early what kind of money they're going to be able to use in their budgets. It would ensure that school funding is timely. It would give school administrators and school boards certainty about school funding for future years, allowing them to plan better. They wouldn't have to wait until the end of the legislative session, often after they've already finished their budgets, before they know how much money they're going to get. Now, the plan is based on a simple, com a simple um, calculation. Half of all of personal income taxes that are collected will automatically go to education, K-12, for school funding formula. If this amount grows by more than 8% over the previous biennium, then half of the increase above the 8% gets split. Half of it goes to the Education Stability Fund, and the other half will go to a successful schools fund. As Education Stability Fund grows, it ensures that we'll have the reserves necessary to keep schools afloat and operating during the next recession. If the economy slows and half of personal income tax collections are less than the 8% that's, you know, that, that's already planned to fund educations, then the Education Stability Fund will have money in it to make up the difference so that education can plan on an 8% biennial growth. And we know, you know, all of us know that inflation goes up and down. It's been pretty low for the last few years, but we lived through the late 70s when inflation was huge. The 40 percent, I mean, excuse me, the 40-year average for inflation is around 4 percent a year. And so by placing it at 8 percent, we're assuring that schools can count on having money over the long term that will deal 
with the, the rising needs for costs. They can plan how much money they're going to spend. Now, the successful school fund would provide money each year to help low-performing schools improve or help schools start new innovative programs. I mean, this is great because I've been saying all along, what are the incentives for schools to do better? What? I feel that, personally, that it's not a good idea to say teachers are all going to get X percent of a raise because why does that reward good teachers and, wh and why should we reward, I mean, we need to reward based on performance those that really can teach well and give them incentives to do better and why reward those that are just there that are not doing any good. And you know, with my size family, I've had kids in public schools for decades and we know over time who the good teachers are and who the bad ones are. And we're very active in our kids' education. We go to the principal and say, guess what? Our child is scheduled to be in Mrs. So-and-so's class. She really needs to be in Mr. So-and-so's class. And they say, well, I'm sorry, we can't do that. I say, understand you can't do that, but she's either going to be in a private school for a semester or she's going to be in Mr. So-and-so's class, and it's your call. And they always say, well, maybe we can make arrangements for her to be in Mr. So-and-so's class. That's unfair. That's unfair to other parents who don't know who the people are. And by the way, God did not create all teachers equally. I mean, you know, that's the way it is in life. And just, we have to realize the facts. We have great, dedicated teachers, but we also have some that you really wouldn't want your children to be sitting in that class because of a number of reasons. Well, why not provide incentives so that there can be a lifting, so that if there are a few bad teachers, that they find other ways to spend their time than molding the minds of young children. And if there are good teachers, then let's make them the example and bring them up as, as, as a standard. And so, anyway, the, these, the incentive program that would have half of excess revenues over the, the 8% would allow money to go to poor schools that need extra help and also allow flexibility to try and increase the quality of education. Now, representatives of the Oregon school boards and the confederations of Oregon school administrators support the stable school plan that the speakers promoted. They see it as a way that we can show Oregon schools what they're going to get so they can count on it. Now, they recognize that funding education shouldn't be a political issue, but it is. Now, Oregonians want stable school funding. Every politician ran on, we're going to fund education first, and we're going to provide stable school funding. And then you get in session, and it's like, well, that was then, and now is now. But in reality, we all know that we need that. We know that we need stable school funding. And, I mean, the people want to know that their children can count on a quality education year after year. That's why the speaker has proposed a plan that will give parents, students, and educators the stability and education they need. This is done by allowing schools to concentrate on educating our kids instead of worrying about next year's funding. And we'll truly be putting education first if we can implement this plan. The present system has only been allowed to continue as long as it has because the school lobby has profited by it. The OEA doesn't like stable school plan because it will make it very difficult for them to labor or to negotiate labor contracts and benefit plans that exceed the rate of growth in spending. That is kind of a shackling that they'd rather not have. I mean, who do they represent? They represent the teachers. Have they ever said that they didn't? Only when there's publicity. This is for the kids. But in reality, they're looking out for one segment of education and not for the whole, uh, the continuum of education which the parents are concerned about. Now, it would also make it harder for the unions to engage in putting pressure tactics like using children and their parents as political pawns, busing them to the Capitol, which happens so often, so they can you know, beg the legislature, saying that uh, they treat us like we're hiding money just so that we don't have to give it to education. I mean, that's just the politics, and it's wrong. You know, it, it, as an illustration of really what drives this kind of education funding political approach, just two days ago, a staff member in the speaker's office overheard an organizer who had come with, she would stand for Oregon, or excuse me, stand for children, 
And she came with a whole group of kids. These are first graders. They're in the hallway just outside the house chambers. And she's coaching them. She's telling them, tell the legislators that if they don't uh, give schools a budget of $5.4 billion or greater, they wouldn't be able to go to school because the schools will close. Now, when do you make seven-year-olds your lobbyists? That's brainwashing tactics. It's scare tactics that it, it make North Korea pl proud. And that's not how it's supposed to be. It's gone too far. It crosses the line. I mean, it's bad enough to mislead the adults of this state, but using children, seven-year-olds like that, is disgusting, and they should be ashamed. Now, before this session is over, the governor, Senate president, and the speaker will come to terms on how to balance the next budget. I'm hoping it won't take all summer. I know Speaker Minnis shares that hope. I mean, her first grandchild is due in, in uh, June. Her second one is due in September. She'd like to spend some time finding out what it's like to be a grandmother. And I understand that. I've got 17 grandchildren. I have a hard time remembering all their names. But when the first two come, by golly, that's a whole different issue. In fact, I've got one that's due this week. Uh, and it, it's, um, one of, we had twin daughters. We started off with twin daughters. And then every two years, had another one. And then after we had four, the twins were old enough that they could be like little mothers. And so it turned into you know, Richardson's Home for Girls. But um, when you have grandchildren, you'd like to spend some time with them. And the speaker would like to do that as well. Now, I don't know what our final budget's going to be like for this biennium. You know, you know, the next biennium we're planning. But there's one thing that I would challenge the city club members, and that is to keep in mind that outside of downtown Portland and a few other pockets here and there, the vast majority of Oregonians think that they're already paying enough. They're not convinced that they need to be enlightened to support more, giving more money to the government. And ideally, they'd like the government to leave them alone and let them live their lives the best they could. But on behalf of them, and that's what we intend to do this session, we're going to live within our means. We're trying to do no, no harm to their wallets. We've got $12.393 billion, which is the highest ever. We've got a substantial amount of money that needs to be divided among the essentials of government in a fair way. Now, while there, there are certainly noble things that could be done, you know, the government could do them if we had more money and wanted to spend it all. There is no dollar figure at which all the needs and all the wants can be met. I mean, I assure you, no matter what is there, it's not enough. Nevertheless, that's the message I came to give you. Uh, I uh, want to thank you for your hospitality, the willingness that uh, you have to promote a healthy public debate. Something I've always appreciated about the City Club is that uh, you come here from broad variety of backgrounds and you are looked to as a leading organization in Oregon as far as what policy matters need to be debated and considered. I'd be happy to take any questions in the remaining time that we have. Thank you. We now come to the question and answer period, and I see we have a lot of people approaching the microphones. I would like to emphasize the question, and that is not a discussion. Uh, questions are a privilege for City Club members only, and because of the length of the line and our time is short, I shall be merciless with waving my question mark tag. Uh, I'd like to introduce our Board of Governors host, who is Mike Burton. Uh, he's been a member of the club since 1994. He's currently Vice Provost and Executive Director for Extended Studies at Portland State University. He spent five sessions in the Oregon House of Representatives himself and eight years as Executive Officer of Metro. Mike. Thank you, and thank you, Representative Richardson. Uh, Citizens certainly are always concerned about how their money is spent, but uh, th this question really revolves on where it's being spent. I think the metropolitan area has long known that uh, we provide most of the state's income in the terms of uh, income taxes and also in revenue. And that only makes sense because the majority of Oregonians live, in fact, north of uh, Salem. And so that's where most of the funds are generated. But specifically, and there's a question about the Oregon School Fund. Uh, May 8th, uh, Oregonian article on the Oregon School Fund indicated that some counties were winners and some were losers in the amount of tax dollars that uh, citizens paid into the fund. Uh, the metropolitan area is, is a clear loser. The state took nearly $200 million last year from Washington and Multnomah counties and shipped it to other parts of the state. 
In a specific example, the Oregonian cited Sil Tillamook County, where taxpayers received only 51 cents back for every dollar paid into the fund, while Jackson County, your county, got a dollar and 34 cents for every dollar paid in. Do you think this is a problem? And if so, how would you address the matter? comes to mind is that Oregon, if you look at our history, has been a natural resource-based state. I mean, trees to Oregon are what corn is to Iowa. And that's the way it was for 100 years until the 80s changed that. And because of votes that took place primarily along the I-5 corridor north of Eugene, the natural resource base to the economy was essentially closed down. And for 20 years, the rural areas of this state have not recovered from the loss of their cluster, of their economic drivers, which has nat been natural resources. And so when that was closed down, it affected the state. And so where did the state send its, uh, spend its attention? On tech industry. You think tech industry had anything to do in Central Point or into Burns? Zero, or very, very little. But it did a great job for stimulating the economy from Eugene north along the I-5 corridor, and especially in Portland and surrounding areas. And so we had this boom in the Oregon economy, but that was in the urban Oregon economy, not in the rural Oregon economy. And then when that bubble popped, everything was affected. And we're, you know, so we're now we're seeing a, reco a recovery starting. But again, the recovery is being generated in the Portland, Salem, Eugene areas. So the answer to the question is, because of votes that the urban area made, such as on Measure 5, I want you to know if Measure 5, which was the, you know, the, the weight changing school funding system, if that had been voted in Southern Oregon, it would not have passed. But because of the vote of the urban area saying we need to pull from local school districts the responsibility for their, their revenues and make essentially the legislature a large school board, there's consequences to that. And when you equalize it, there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. And so as a result of the vote, the, and as a result of decisions affecting the economy, the more rural areas have become the more depressed areas of the economy. And so because we are a state, we watch out for those that need it the most. And so there's, there is a, a lessening. Now, if the rural areas' economies could become as strong as, and as vibrant as we'd like them to be, we would be happy to shift that and be supporting our, our urban brothers and sisters. Next question. And please do try to keep your questions under 30 seconds. We have a lot of people and not very much time. Thanks. And I'll try and keep my answers under 30 seconds, too. Yes. <laughs> uh, Elaine Kogan, and, and thank you for, uh, I think, a very eloquent ex exposition of your political point of view. Uh, let me ask you about this stool that we keep referring to about taxes. Is it a three, should it be a three-legged stool, and should the third leg be a sales tax? I believe the answer to that only is yes, only in those states that don't have the third-legged stool. Last August, I, you know, I knew I was going to be coming back and I was going to be involved in Ways and Means, and so I took a trip on, with my wife, and we went to the legislatures of Idaho, Utah, Nevada, and California, and met with their fiscal analysts, and it was a great experience for me to do this. So I'm in California, and they have $30 billion of red ink, and they've got a three-legged stool. And you know what I heard on the floor? We need to raise the taxes because these folks aren't paying their fair share, which is the term you always hear when you want somebody else's money. And so do I believe that it's needed? I don't believe that it's needed, but I don't know. I think we need to look at it. We need to analyze the, the history of the ebb and flow of, of resources and be able to pass adjustments in the way that we tax in Oregon based on a rational approach. But I'll tell you what, that decision has to come from the people. If it comes from the legislature, it's going to get voted down because the legislature doesn't have the respect of the people. But if your organization, and maybe like Chalkboard and some other organizations, the, the Portland Alliance, if the people will get together and come up with an, a, a proposal to make the change and give that to the legislature, then we can enact it, and the people will accept a decision from the people much better than they would accept 
the legislature saying, well, we need to implement a different kind of tax because they'll say, yeah, right. You know, they, they've been there before. Yes, sir. Chris Smith, City Club member. Uh, Representative Richardson, uh, several years ago, in order to help answer the question of how much funding do we need for our schools, a bipartisan commission was appointed and came up with the quality education model. Uh, would the speaker's school stability plan fund uh, schools at the level recommended by the quality education model? And, and if not, then why is that the right answer? The quality education model was set in, a, in, in the, the paradigm of what would be the, the perfect way to organize our education. But unfortunately, it does not re relate to the reality of finances. If we were to fund education at the quality education model, we could just do away with seniors and people with disabilities program. I mean, because there's not enough money. And so you can talk philosophically about that, but in reality, we need to see how much money we can afford to spend on education and what can we do to help get the maximum performance, the best results, the best measurements for the money that we have available. Other states are doing this. We're not in the bottom of the funding of education. We have ample amounts of revenue. We need to watch how we spend it. I'll tell you, one of the problems we have is the PERS debt is so huge, and the cost of maintaining the PERS system is, I mean, the sound you hear is the vacuum sucking of money from our education budget to go into PERS. And we start talking about 15 to 25 percent of every salary dollar going into a retirement plan when the state of Washington has one to three percent, now you've got a problem. And that's hard dollars that could be going in the classroom and we do not have the gumption, the courage, the ability to deal with that, rea that, that problem. B.J. Seymour, City Club member. Uh, I'd like to ask you about something that doesn't have to do with money. Um, Two-part question. One is, where do you stand on civil unions uh, for, particularly, of course, for same-sex couples? And uh, if you are not in agreement with that, I'd like to call your attention to ORS 33.460, which was passed in 1981. Under that law, a person whose sex has been changed by surgical procedure can obtain a legal change of sex by the same system as a change of name. Yeah, I, I hear you. Why should Oregon deny marriage to, or civil unions to same-sex couples who have not undergone surgery. Okay, well, that was a nice speech, and I, you know, I was thinking about reading that before I got here, but forgot to read that statute. But I can tell you what's going on with civil unions. Civil unions is Senate Bill 1000. It has two parts. The first part says that sexual orientation will be lifted up to a civil right to the same protection stat protected status as religion and race. And the second part is that civil unions shall be implemented in Oregon, which shall be marriage by another name. I do not favor that bill. I was in favor of Measure 36, and I want you to know, maybe some of you were in favor of it as well. The vast majority of Oregon favored traditional marriage, and 18 states across the country voted on it, and they basically said that marriage will be honored by society as it's been known in the past. And the people did not vote on that for an in run to be pulled and say, Mar we're gonna have marriage by another name. Nevertheless, and having said that, there were many issues of fairness that came out during the Measure 36 campaign that were, um, that should be given credence. You know, what about going and visiting in the hospital? What about inheritance? What about last or end of life decisions? And so the House has a bill that we are, are proposing called reciprocal benefits, which provides those benefits, regardless of sexual orientation, to any couple that can't be married, to elderly sisters that have never married, why should they not have the benefits merely because they're not lesbian? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. If it's about fairness, reciprocal benefits will provide fairness to non-married couples regardless of sexual orientation, and that way we don't try and circumvent the will of the people who voted for Measure 36, but we do honor the reality that there's issues of fairness that we can and should solve. Thank you for the question. Well, let's try this issue of fairness. Uh, three months ago, my spouse and I asked for a quote on a new car insurance policy, being a insurance lawyer, you can help me out with this. Um, a very favorable, 
full quote was offered, given our income, our credit history, our driving record, and our marital status. However, after completing the formal application and truthfully indicating that my spouse was also a woman, the quote was withdrawn and a higher one offered. Do you think that is fair? And if so, why? And if not, what do you think our recourse is? Well, you know what? It doesn't sound fair, but fairness is not the issue. Government cannot make everything fair. This is an unfair world. I wish I were taller. I wish I were better looking. But it's not fair. But I, it is what it is. You're making a decision not to be in a normal marriage. And I understand that. I honor that. You know, that's, that is your choice. Society says, if you, we want to promote a family unit that has a, a basic structure, which is the foundation for society as we know it. Now, could that change in the future? It could. Is it going to change now? No, the people have voted on it. And so when society wants to promote something, they honor it by giving it special privileges. Society says, we want to promote home ownership. And so we let you deduct interest on home mortgages, but you can't deduct interest on other mortgages. Is that fair? It's not. What if you want to live in your, apart in your, uh, your office building you know, or, or in something else, and, and you want it to be fair because people that buy homes get to deduct their interest, and for whatever reason, you couldn't. It's not about fairness. It's about decisions that society makes, and this one doesn't cut in your favor. And I, mean, I think that that's just the way it is. Yes, sir. Getting back on the budget, Ken Ray, City Club member. Part of Measure 30, uh, which failed, was the continuation, not an increase, but continuation of an existing tax on cigarettes, which was about a 10 cent a pack tax, that would have continued to fund some services of the Oregon Health Plan. You're now on the front line dealing with federal Medicaid cuts and are seeing firsthand what the, what the federal government is doing. Is a renewal of that 10 cent cigarette tax, which expired by virtue of Measure 30's failure, is that on the table, or are you looking at other revenue sources to help bridge the gap in funding for Oregon Health Plan? Okay. Uh, the the re restoration of the 10 cent tobacco tax is not on the table this session because of the votes of Measure 28 and Measure 30. It should not have been put in this bill. Measure 30 was the result of another, in one of those circumstances where greed overcame common sense. There was something in that bill for everyone to hate. For instance, uh, the initial suggestion was we shouldn't have rich elderly people deducting medications, and so let's say if they make more than $50,000, then they can't take deductions on medical treatment. And that, you know, that's reasonable. But when the bill came out, it was $15,000. In other words, look at how much more money we can get if we take that deduction away from people making twelve dollars or $1,400 a month. Anyway, uh, there is no new revenue sources on the table for this biennium because the people have spoken in Measure 30, and we're going to live within our means. And, and with the recent forecast uh, being for extra revenues, um, I can assure you that uh, the House has no intention of implementing new taxes or re-implementing old taxes this session. Yes, sir. Steve Novick, City Club member. Representative Richardson, in her voters' pamphlet statement in 2004, Speaker Minnis said that in 2003 she protected schools and public safety and seniors from cuts implying that those were spared from cuts, when in fact they're most of the budget and they were cut. In her next sentence in her pamphlet, she said that she opposed Measure 30, implying that must have been intended to go to services other than those services, which in fact was false, the money would have gone to the same services. So, given your goal, how do you square your goal of restoring faith in government with that kind of dishonest talk from the Speaker of the House? Obviously a neutral question. Uh, and it's one that you need to address to the speaker since I can't respond to what she did or didn't put into the voters' pamphlet. Yes, sir. Paul Miller's club member. Um, you seem critical of the citizens coming to the legislature to lobby for uh, education funding. Uh, how do you feel about the business lobbyists who bribe, excuse me, uh, not bribe, uh, made significant campaign uh, donations to legislatures over the years that have resulted in a complete reversal of the traditional uh, proportions of taxes paid by businesses and individuals. To where businesses are paying, in some cases, $10 a year, and the rest of us are paying a much higher burden. First, let me say that um, what my comment was is I don't think it's fair to, to indoctrinate seven year olds and make them into lobbyists. Okay? Now, let, let me, my, you asked your question, let me give my answer. What I am, I mean, lobbying is part of life. That's why you have second readings and third readings. You can't just pass a bill in one day because when it was set into place, it was so you could go tell the farmer 
he could get on his horse and ride up there and try and lobby his representative against a law that that person feels bad. We have a representative democracy. Lobby is the idea of special interests trying to promote their interests. It's not always bad. They're just converge, or they're, they're, they're contradictory. And so you have the unions backing the Democrats and the Democrats have to basically kowtow to that. I was on the PERS committee. We could have done so much better, but that we did what could be done based on the reality. You've got a business lobby that support the Republicans. And so there's a natural reason to, you know, they support people who kind of philosophically believe the way they do, right? It's the way the system works. It's, it is a dynamic. It's been said that there's two things you don't want to watch. One is how you make sausage, and the other is how you make law. And I understand that because it isn't a pretty picture, but it goes through both houses and a, and a governor and the reason it goes through all of that difficulty is so that we have fewer bad laws that we have to live with, but it does mean fewer good laws as well. It is just the process. Uh, we are at the end of our regularly scheduled program, but uh, Representative Richardson can stay a little bit longer, so any of those of you who have to leave, please do so, and uh, thank you for the brevity of the questions of the people who are left in line. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Jay Ward, City Club member, and I'm kind of alarmed to find out I'm a, a special interest as I'm the parent of a 10-year-old, a 10-year-old who was down on the steps of the state capitol on President's Day um, lobbying for increased funding for schools. And he wasn't trying to scare you. He's the one who's scared, along with the, other, the members of his school, whose school is being closed, Smith Elementary, along with four other elementary schools and one middle school here in Portland. So the other night, as I was holding him, he was crying because the school is closing, I was trying to figure out, and maybe you can help me with this, how do I explain to him